take few minutes to introduce uh, Dr. Vikram Patel, who is the speaker for this session. Vikram Patel, of course, in India, to an audience of mental health professionals, does not require any specific introduction. He is a professor of psych professor of global mental health at uh, Harvard University. But for a number of years, he has worked at Sangat in Goa, which is a non-governmental organization. Uh, so his work is very well known to all people who study mental health, any of the mental health disciplines. But before I welcome him and request him to talk, uh, I must say that uh, my personal association with him has been for more than three decades. And most strangely, I first met with him not in India, not in Goa, not in Delhi, but in Zimbabwe when uh, Vikram was uh, as part of his Rhodes Scholarship doing his PhD work. And like uh, somebody who is very, very serious about his scholarship, he went to Rhodesia. Zimbabwe's previous name was Rhodesia. That is when I met him. I was working those days with the World Health Organization. I was on duty travel. And there was this young man who was doing PhD, uh, you know, on primary mental health care, etc. It's a long story. I have known him from those days. And today he is the professor of global health at the Harvard Medical School. So it is a great oh, pleasure. Like for, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Vikram and uh, invite him to give this talk. He is going to talk about transforming mental health globally. Please welcome Professor Vikram Patel. Vikram, stage Thank is you yours. So, Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to check. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We can see okay. you as well as hear you. All right, wonderful. Let me uh, let me just pull up my presentation. Uh, uh, and can you see my slides? Yes, Vikram. We okay, can. wonderful. Thank thank you very much, Mohan, for that very warm introduction. Uh, maybe I should also um, give my own recollection. Uh, I remember uh, your visit to Harare very well. I was a lecturer, actually, not a Rhodes Scholar. I was a Rhodes Scholar many years before that when I went to Oxford from India. That's how I managed to get to Britain. <laughs> but um, you, you, I remember very well giving me the most important advice of my career, uh, back in mid 1990s, when I said I really wanted to come back to India, and back then, um, you know, the Medical Council of India did not recognize uh, uh, international qualifications in psychiatry, and I was being told by a government institution, which was my first choice to work in, that I I needed to requalify in psychiatry after having completed my psychiatric training at the Maudsley Hospital, and I remember you telling me, Mohan, that perhaps someone like you would be much better off working in the civil society sector, in the NGO sector. And that, and that really was, um, uh, you know, a very important piece of advice for which I'm forever grateful to you because I, I follow that, uh, uh, you know, very conscientiously. And uh, uh, really the rest of my career happened then in the NGO sector through the organization Sangha that I'll refer to a little bit more uh, in, 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 in my remarks today. I also wanted to... Uh, just say how sorry I am that I cannot be there in person. I had so much hope that I could, but uh, uh, given my uh, given my role at Harvard Medical School, this is a very important time for me to be in the classroom with my students. And unfortunately, that means I cannot be with you in person. But I also wanted to pay homage uh, uh, to Professor Naren Wig, who is, uh, uh, you know, for all of us who are passionate about social psychiatry around the world. Um, uh, his name is uh, an iconic one, uh, uh, one that, you know, has always been a source of enormous inspiration uh, for those of us who have tried to reach uh, the last mile in mental health care in all parts of the world. Uh, today, I'm, I'm going to be uh, presenting to you a, uh, a overarching lecture based on a paper we wrote recently uh, that I'll speak about in a moment about some of the important lessons we have learned over the last 10 to 15 years that offer a very promising and hopeful way to thinking about how we can transform mental health systems globally. But first, let me examine why we need to transform mental health systems globally. Let's start just by simply looking at the relative burden of mental and substance use disorders in the past 25 years as recorded in the Global Burden of Disease uh, reports. And what you can see here across all countries of the world organized according to how developed they are, uh, there has been a steady increase in that relative burden over the last 25 years 
on an average across all countries of the world in this green line here, a roughly 50% increase in that relative burden. Much of that burden is actually concentrated in young people. In this particular chart, what you can see here is that in young people between the ages of 10 and 30, roughly about 25% of the total burden of suffering due to health-related reasons is accounted for by mental and substance use disorders in the blue bars and self-harm uh, in the gray bars. And I think in this sense, mental health problems are quite different from non-communicable diseases with which they're often lumped because most non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and heart disease are actually diseases of middle-aged and older adults. Um, why, th why is that important? For obvious reasons, uh, during the ages of 10 to 30, one could argue these are the most sensitive years from a developmental perspective uh, in the entire life course. Another very well-established finding is that mental health problems are inequitably distributed in the population. Here I show a chart from the National Mental Health Survey of India, the largest survey ever conducted in India, which clearly demonstrates this association between poverty uh, and, and poor mental health. In this instance, uh, depression on, uh, here you can see on the y-axis, the prevalence of depression. Um, and what you can see on the x-axis is income quintiles. And it's very obviously clear that there's a, a direct correlation between uh, how rich or poor you are and the prevalence of depression. And in fact, you can see similar uh, association with virtually the full range of mental health problems. Uh, recently, with economists colleagues in, in Harvard University, we examined the relationship between poverty and depression, not just simply by looking at the description of the association, but really what might be the potential mechanisms um, through which this association is uh, uh, can be explained. And here you can see an infographic that comes from our paper in science, which demonstrates that it's a bi-directional relationship and there is robust evidence for a range of mechanisms. So it's important for us to be uh, you know, conscious that these observations are underpinned by very complex pathways, uh, which uh, explain both how people living in poverty are more likely to slide into poor mental health, in this case, mood and anxiety problems, but also how living with a mental health problem can actually worsen an economic uh, uh, condition, indicating that what we need to be thinking about is interventions that interrupt both pathways, the pathways from poverty po to poor mental health, as well as the pathways from poor mental health into poverty. So let, that, that's just a snapshot. I, I, I'm sure everyone in the audience is, is, is fully aware of why we need to act on mental health. Now, let me turn to a, a somewhat more different question, which is that, is the issue about poor mental health one that is largely the result of inadequate investment in the mental health system? This is important because very often we think about uh, the, the, the solution to health problems as simply scaling up. Uh, evidence-based interventions and that the real challenge, especially in countries like India, is that we do not have adequate resources, for example, adequate mental health professionals or adequate money uh, being invested uh, in mental health care. So let me take the example of the US, a country that I've gotten to know much better in the last six years since I uh, started working at Harvard University. Um, the US is by far and away the world's most resourced country when it comes to mental health. Here on this slide, I show you the per capita uh, 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 number of mental health professionals. By mental health professionals, I'm here referring actually only to psychiatrists. Uh, and what you can see here is that um, if you look at the countries of the world, these are the largest, most populous countries of the world, uh, arranged uh, in, in a order of their population size on the x-axis and the number of psychiatrists on the y-axis, the US is a complete outlier. In other words, for its population, it has more psychiatrists than any other country in the world. Consider, for example, India, which has roughly about uh, four times the population of the US. You can look at the ratio of the number of psychiatrists. So the US is, US is extremely well-resourced when it comes to the number of mental health professionals. But what people don't realize often is it also spends a lot more money on mental health care than virtually any other disease area. This chart comes from a, a analysis of the total spending 
on different diseases uh, in the U.S. Uh, it's a few years old, but I don't believe that the, uh, uh, that the overall story is any different today. It's pretty astonishing. We often think that, you know, uh, the, the healthcare system spends a lot more on heart disease and cancer. But it turns out that if you include institutionalized care, which is, of course, as I'll show you in a moment, uh, not, not, not an insignificant part of the U.S. mental health care system, mental disorders top the list of the most expensive conditions in the U.S. So here we're talking about a country that has more mental health resources and spends more dollars per capita. So you can't imagine a more resourced country. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what impact has this enormous spending and this enormous number of mental health professionals had uh, on the prevalence uh, and other important metrics related to the burden of mental health problems? Well, disappointingly, certainly it has had zero impact on the population burden of mental illness as reflected on the prevalence of depression in this particular, of any mental illness, sorry, as reflected in this slide. If anything, actually, between 2008 and 2015, there's been a steady uptick in the prevalence, particularly amongst the youngest Americans. During the same period, by the way, uh, suicide mortality in the youngest Americans, that's, you know, young adults, has gone up 50%. 50% increase in suicide mortality rates uh, in young adult Americans. Now, if I had to show you a slide of uh, pretty much any other health condition, major health condition, let's say, for example, stroke mortality or, or cardiovascular disease incidence, you would have found a very different picture, a steady decline. And I'll also show you that in a moment, a little later, a comparison with depression. If anything, as I mentioned earlier, mortality related to poor mental health, both substance use as well as suicide mortality, has shown a steady uptick over the last 20 odd years, something that the Nobel Prize winning economists uh, uh, have, 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 got, have coined as um, uh, the deaths of despair. Uh, Despair is, of course, an interesting uh, word that's been used in this instance by economists. Uh, but actually, um, one could argue from a mental health perspective uh, that despair also has a very profound clinical importance. In spite of all this vast spending and the number of mental health uh, uh, specialists, uh, there are more people in more states of the U.S. Uh, with serious mental illness who call a a prison, their home, rather than in a place of shelter, such as a psychiatric hospital. And I want to end this segment of my remarks by uh, really quoting my good friend Tom Insel, uh, the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health, the world's most uh, uh, you know, uh, influential research funding body in the mental health space. His words speak for themselves. It shows that not even the amount of money, huge sums of money spent on research. So we've already seen the U.S. spends a vast amount of money on care, most of it through mental health professionals. It also spends a vast amount of money on science. In spite of all this spending, every single metric related to mental health at the population level in the U.S. has worsened over the past two decades. It's clear then, friends, that simply throwing more money at this particular problem is not going to solve the problem. Over the last uh, seven or eight years, there have been a number of different reports produced by agencies like the World Bank on the left-hand side at the top here, the World Health Organization, such as this one on the right, as well as the World Mental Health Report, and at least three different uh, commissions uh, in The Lancet that have examined mental health from different perspectives on stigma, on depression in particular, and on global mental health and sustainable development. With a group of uh, uh, co-authors, uh, we examined this entire body of syntheses and high-level documents produced in these last five to eight years to examine, is there a way of us understanding why all countries in the world have actually failed to address the burden of mental health problems in the same kind of way that they have succeeded uh, 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 you know, in addressing some of the other uh, health problems in the population. And are there any lessons from new ways of thinking, new paradigms uh, that can help us chart uh, a direction for the future? In this rest of my lecture, I'm gonna just simply summarize 
uh, five principles and four policy recommendations that we identified from the synthesis. Uh, you can find much more details uh, on these findings or on these recommendations in a paper that was published just last month in The Lancet, which is shown here uh, on this slide. But let me start by, first of all, giving a provocative, maybe not that provocative for this particular audience, um, uh, you know, diagnosis, if I can use that word. But as you'll see in a moment, it's perhaps a word that one we should be using less in, in our field. But why have all countries failed to address mental health needs in an equitable way across the population? And what we arrived at is that the most important reason is the narrow biomedical framing of mental health through the prism of diagnosed mental disorders. This in turn has led to the privileging of biological mechanisms over social and psychological mechanisms, even though there is such a large body of psychological and social science that clearly and compellingly demonstrates how these mechanisms are profoundly important to explain both the emergence of mental health problems, but also their persistence. The privileging of treatment over prevention, and not just any treatment, but treatment that is provided by specialists, because of course the diagnostic process is so complicated that only specialists have the requisite skills to actually complete a diagnostic process. And because specialists are primarily concerned with clinical phenomena, there's also been a privileging of clinical phenomena focused on symptoms over recovery, which of course, as we all know, is a profoundly important concept that's been really uh, given to our field, uh, generated for our field uh, by people with the lived experience of mental health problems, acknowledging that clinical phenomena are only one part of the overall recovery process, only one part of what people living with mental health problems really desire in terms of their, uh, uh, their, their self-declared uh, outcomes uh, in the long term. So I want to turn to the five principles that we identified that we, we suggest are paradigm shifts or shifts in the way we think about the future of mental health care systems. The first principle is to move from a focus that is dominant right now on the treatment of diagnosed mental illness to a rebalanced emphasis on promoting mental health and preventing mental ill health. We do know what the targets for prevention should be, thanks to the rich and large body of literature that demonstrates the association between poverty and poor mental health, but also in particular, the experience of childhood adversities and poverty we have a very clear set of interventions that we believe demonstrate how prevention in the mental health space can be carried out. It's important for us to recognize that prevention is central not only to the mental health uh, issues, but in fact, across the full range of health problems. On this chart taken from the, uh, again, the global burden of disease, what we contrast is the declining uh, prevalence or uh, the, the disability adjusted life years uh, attributed to ischemic heart disease between 1990 and 2019 with that due to depression. And of course, it's self-evident that depression is a flat line. There's been absolutely no change over time globally, but there has been a steady and very significant decline actually in ischemic heart disease. Now, let's be clear for a moment. This decline has very little to do with cardiac bypass surgery or angioplasty. It is almost entirely to do with prevention, <laughs> both prevention at the level of individual behavior, such as for example, uh, smoking cessation, but also prevention through uh, the, the use of, uh, of pharmacological interventions for hypertension and reducing cholesterol levels. So this is entirely being driven by prevention and not by treatment. And we can see now evidence about what kinds of preventive interventions targeting social environments can also potentially reduce the burden of mental health problems. Uh, I've been privileged to work with an amazing group of, um, uh, of, of researchers working at the national level in Brazil. Uh, this is a program of work led by uh, my, my mentee, Dani Machado, um, and her colleagues at the University of Bahia in Salvador. 
um, which has been examining the relationship between one of the largest cash transfer programs in the world, um, the Bolsa Familia program, which is a, a Brazilian national program that uh, offers cash transfers directly to low-income Brazilians. This is the first of a series of analyses that are, are in press or will be published in the coming years that demonstrates the large uh, impacts of cash transfers on, in this particular instance, uh, suicide mortality. Not only do we, sh the, 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 that we, we observe nearly a 40% reduction in suicide mortality prospectively over time amongst low-income households that received uh, cash transfers, but future publications will show that there is also a specific effect on reducing premature mortality for people with serious mental illness, which we know is an extremely vulnerable group uh, for premature uh, uh, mortality. I'm going to actually reshare my slides because I want to show you a video. Uh, and for that, I do need to reset my sound system so that you can hear the sound. Uh, Another very good example, and you know, throughout the remainder of my lecture, I'm going to keep pointing to work that's been done by my colleagues in Sangat, which for those of you who are not familiar with Sangat, Sangat is an NGO that I co-founded as a child development center back in 1996 in Goa. Uh, today, Sangat works in about 10 states of India directly with state governments uh, on a range of different mental health related implementation uh, 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 programs. Uh, from early childhood interventions all the way through uh, to supporting recovery processes using frontline workers. And through the, throughout the rest of my talk, you will see examples of Sangat's work uh, being illustrated through these different principles. So sticking to the first principle on prevention, um, adverse childhood experiences are probably the single most well uh, uh, observed and, and, and replicated risk factor for poor mental health across the life course. We have very robust evidence on how parenting interventions in the first thousand days that integrate responsive parenting with other uh, uh, aspects of newborn care, such as nutrition, uh, are extremely effective. In the Alana Palana program, Sangat has partnered with the government of Telangana uh, to incorporate these evidence-based practices uh, for responsive parenting within existing group level intervention that is coordinated by Anganwadi teachers and embedded in the integrated child development scheme. And what we did was we designed a series of video based uh, 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 materials that could be then used in group interaction with new mothers uh, coordinated by Anganwadi uh, teachers on teaching new mothers not only how to feed their baby, but while they're feeding their baby, how to play and interact with young children, and also, of course, uh, to reduce uh, toxic stressors. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you a very short video of one of those group uh, interventions in progress. <laughs> Let me now turn to the second principle. The second, the first principle was a rebalance emphasis on treatment as well as prevention. The second principle now looks specifically at the issue about what we treat. At the moment, our mental health care systems are dominated by a focus on clinical interventions for, <coughs> for severe clinical presentations, the diagnosed, diagnosable mental disorders. We call for a rebalanced emphasis that recognizes the dimensional model of mental health problems, that <coughs> explicitly acknowledges the stages of the evolution of mental illness. You know, mental illness doesn't suddenly appear out of the blue. It isn't the case that there's a clear cut binary between having a mental illness and not having a mental illness. Oftentimes there is a period, sometimes months, as a mental illness actually, even years actually, 
as a mental illness evolves in an individual, offering really unique opportunities for early intervention. And this is really best captured in the staging model that offers an excellent hybrid between the categorical binary model of mental disorders and a fully dimensional model of mental health and illness. <laughs> in the Lancet Commission on Depression led by Helen Herman, we demonstrate how such a staging model, which can be applied to the case of depression so that care is determined not by a diagnosis, by a person's needs. So if we think about stage one in particular, when mood related, anxiety related and stress related symptoms are actually emerging, before you can actually reach a diagnostic level of depression, this offers a unique opportunity at the population level uh, for early intervention. But equally, you can see in subsequent stages, there may be different interventions that need to be tailored to the stage of the illness, whether it's a first episode of depression, whether it's a recurrent depressive episode, or whether it's a persistent depressive episode, because for each stage, there will be a different approach for that individual. There isn't a one size fits all approach for depression. But turning to stage one, <clears throat> stage one is about early intervention. And early intervention typically requires us to be able to access individuals who are just beginning to experience depressive symptoms, which is typically not in psychiatric clinics, but will happen in community and primary care settings. And that takes us to principle three. We need to move from a focus on highly trained and expensive mental health specialists to deliver care, which dominates the way we organize mental health care systems to a much more diverse workforce in particularly frontline providers working in primary care and community settings so that we can provide early intervention in the moment when people actually need it. Now, Sangat has been uh, one of the most pioneering institutions in the world, uh, which has really contributed over the last two decades uh, on this approach of empowering people who are working on the front line, such as, for example, community health workers, peer support workers, families of people living with mental health problems, peers in school settings, to deliver brief psychosocial interventions for the prevention and care of mental health problems. And here you can see just uh, on this slide, the titles of just some of the range of different randomized control trial papers that have emerged over these last two decades of work uh, papers that testify to the effectiveness of this approach for the prevention of mental health problems, for example, in school-based interventions or working with old, uh, for indicated prevention for older adults living with chronic diseases, for the treatment of acute mental health problems such as drinking problems, perinatal depression, and depression in primary care, and for promoting recovery and inclusion in people with disabling, enduring mental health problems such as schizophrenia or autism. One such intervention, uh, as, as just an example, is the Healthy Activity Program. This is a six session treatment based on behavioral activation that was designed uh, in my program in Sangat. It was then evaluated in a randomized controlled trial with nearly 500 primary care attenders with severe depression attending 10 primary health centers in Goa. We demonstrated very large effects, not only in the short term, as you can see here at three months, that this was only six sessions of treatment. Um, uh, each session is about 30 to 35 minutes. And you can see with that relatively short treatment in patients with very severe depression, two thirds had remitted at three months and they stayed well at 12 months. And here you can see uh, the comparison line of simply MH gap care, which is essentially training the primary care doctor on how to use antidepressant medication. A few years ago, Abhijit Banerjee, the Nobel Prize winning economist, approached me and said, Vikram, can we follow up these individuals who you treated uh, with depression to find out what happened to them five years later? And he was particularly interested to look not only at clinical recovery, but at economic outcomes. And we were astonished that 60 months after this brief six session treatment, the, uh, the, the J-PAL team, which Abhijit Banerjee leads, 
observed a effect of the intervention on remission rates five years after the treatment that was statistically significant. The Healthy Activity Program has now been evaluated in multiple other settings. For example, a large trial for people with depression, uh, living uh, uh, people with HIV who are depressed in Uganda. Similarly, a large trial in Nepal. But I, what I'm really delighted about is that this treatment that was designed in India for delivery by non-specialist health workers in routine care setting has now been adapted for use in the world's richest country, in the US. And as we speak, a six session treatment for, behavior, for depression based on the healthy activity program has been adapted both into American English as well as in Spanish and is being now tested with community health workers in the US. Indeed, this evidence based, you know, I, I, I think this, this evidence based on the use of frontline workers is perhaps the single most exciting evidence base in our field. More than 100 randomized controlled trials that testify to how we can deliver clinical and preventive interventions. On the slide, you see another example of, uh, uh, of this approach, the Friendship Bench from Zimbabwe, where Dixon Chibanda and his team train grandmothers in the local community to deliver a six session problem solving intervention for people with depression, such as this mother with this young baby. Uh, the intervention is called the Friendship Bench, as you can see, because it's delivered on a bench that has been uh, placed in the compound of a primary health center, which you can see at the back. There are many systematic reviews now that testify to the usefulness of this approach, not just in developing countries, but also in high income countries. Principle number four, we need to move from what has been sadly an, a way that, that we deliver mental health care that really often is very patronizing with a lack of respect for the dignity and autom autonomy of people with a lived experience to a rights-based approach, one that provides alternatives to coercion and violence, which is sadly yet all too common, far too common in mental health care and achieves parity in all respects to do with dignity and rights with other aspects of healthcare. The WHO has produced an outstanding toolkit, the Quality Rights Toolkit for all of you who work in any kind of mental health care setting, whether it's in, a, in an outpatient department or an inpatient unit or in some uh, community-based uh, service. This is an outstanding toolkit that gives you a set of tools that can be used to ensure that your services are delivered in a rights-based perspective. There are also very many different evidence-based practices to end coercion in all forms, especially coercion that is characterized by substituted decision-making in mental health care and switching from substituted decision-making to supported decision-making. And of course, this is also a very important um, uh, framework or a principle of India's National Mental Health Care Act. And my final principle is to move from a design of the mental health care system that is really provider centric. Consider, for example, that we always expect our patients to come to us in the hospitals that we work in rather than go to our patients in the community to a system that is centered on the experiences, aspirations and needs of people living with mental health problems and their families in every aspect of the mental health care system from its design to the delivery of interventions, the holding the system accountable. And here I'll draw your attention to the many different uh, uh, lived experience groups that have formed in the last decade. Perhaps one of the best examples is the Global Mental Health Peer Network, uh, which was launched by Charlene Sunkel, a South African uh, uh, lady who has schizophrenia. Um, uh, this is a network that now exceeds more than 40 countries, including India, uh, where People with a lived experience have joined hands together in solidarity uh, and not in opposition to mental health professionals, but really to provide a very strong voice on how people with a lived experience can be at the center of the care process. In our work in Sangat, we actively engage with young uh, with, with people with a lived experience. And here is just one example. Uh, one of the big programs in Sangat that I've led is on uh, youth mental health. And my colleagues in Sangat, uh, have demonstrated how a program that is seeking to address youth mental health 
must actively engage with young people. And in this instance, of course, what young people love the most is social media and, 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 and storytelling as a way uh, to engage them in conversations about mental health. And I would encourage you to go to the websites here of It's OK to Talk, Manmela, uh, and the Outlive program, uh, which demonstrates how one can engage young people, uh, particularly with a lived experience. I want to end then <clears throat> with four policy actions uh, that really reflect how these principles, these five paradigm shifts or principles can be translated uh, into practice through a range of different policies. And we identify four important policy actions in the health policy paper. The first, when we think about prevention and care, we must think about diverse sectors, literally a whole of society approach that recognizes that there are interventions that can be delivered across sectors, not just for individuals and families across the life course, but in diverse sectors in which people may spend time from, from schools and workplaces all the way through to the online spaces, especially for young people, and whole of society interventions, such as, for example, the cash transfer program that I referred to earlier. Second, we need to redesign the architecture of the care delivery system. And we really, in the paper, consider that there need to be two different foci of care delivery. For people with common mental health problems, such as mood, anxiety, and trauma-related problems, the primary care platform should be the focus of care. But for people with serious enduring mental illnesses like schizophrenia and autism, this should be specialist care. And this means that specialist care must integrate primary care for people with enduring mental illnesses. But a very important part of both nodes of care are frontline workers such as community health workers who act as liaisons between the healthcare delivery setting and the community. This means that healthcare systems need to build the capacity of frontline workers to deliver the interventions that I showed you earlier have been shown to work in randomized control trials. And a big question is how we can rapidly build the capacity of these frontline workers. Three years ago, joint as a joint program in Harvard Medical School in Sangat, we launched Empower, which is a program that is deploying a suite of digital tools to enable frontline workers to learn, master, and deliver quality assured evidence-based psychosocial interventions. And today, as we speak, the first fruits of success of Empower are happening in rural Madhya Pradesh, where in three districts of MP, nearly a thousand ashas of MP's National Health Mission Program have been trained in the delivery of the Healthy Activity Program. And I was just looking at some of the uh, early data that has emerged from that program, and I'm astonished that these ashas have already delivered the six session treatment in the communities that they serve to over 2000 patients with depression. And that's just the very early data. And that the treatment completion rates are 90% plus. 90% plus of the individuals with depression have completed the six session treatment and more than 90% have remitted uh, uh, in the short term. And we're obviously gonna hopefully follow up these individuals in the long term. So really a remarkable example of how uh, Sangat is now scaling up these brief treatments in partnership, in this instance, with the state government of Madhya Pradesh. The third policy action is to invest more. Of course, we need more money for mental health, but we also need to invest wisely. We need to allocate resources for mental health problems, not just in the mental health budget, but also in the general and primary care budget. I feel we need to be arguing that if depression care should happen in primary care, then the money for depression care should be from the primary care budget, because that is how we can fully integrate depression in primary care. We also need to allocate resources for people with mental health problems in the social welfare budget, for example, in the work of uh, in the budgets of the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment. And lastly, we need to allocate resources in the mental health budget for community-based support. Right now, most of the money in the National Mental Health Program is still devoted to hospital-based care. You know, 
we do need to argue to actually shift some of those resources for community-based support for people with enduring mental illness. And lastly, if you don't measure and if you don't monitor, then we will not achieve long-term outcomes that we desire. Ensuring accountability is central to the success of any healthcare program. Over the last few years, in partnership with the World Health Organization, uh, my uh, Global Mental Health at Harvard initiative that we launched a few years ago and led by Shekhar Saxena, who used to head uh, the Department of Mental Health at WHO and now is a colleague at Harvard, we launched this program called Countdown to distill a set of metrics can be applied across countries and within countries over time, allowing us now to be able to compare the performance of mental health care systems using a common set of metrics and you can find the first uh, results of the evaluation of the application of those metrics um, in uh, on, the, on, on the website that you can see on this slide. So we do have now a set of metrics, which I would encourage those of us working at mental health system level to begin to apply within the context of the healthcare systems that you work in. And this is my last slide. I wanna end by suggesting to you all that business as usual, which means a mental health care system that is largely predicated to the treatment in specialist settings of people with diagnosed mental disorders will fail. It has not succeeded in reducing the global burden of mental illness, nor has it succeeded in reducing the burden of mental illness in any country of the world, no matter how many mental health professionals or how many dollars per capita you spend on mental health care. On the other hand, we have a diverse range of scientific disciplines from developmental science to psychological science to implementation science, but also grassroots experiences, particularly of people with the lived experience that point to a radically different approach to understanding mental health and preventing and caring for mental health problems. What's really exciting, friends, is that most of these actions rely for the most part on resources that every country and every country has, because so much of what you've heard today from me deploys people in communities rather than specialists. And no community that I've ever worked in doesn't have people who care for one another. And lastly, this is a perfect moment for us to implement these new ideas. For the pandemic and climate change are examples of threats that have galvanized political and public interest in mental health. It is now time for all of us who are passionate about this subject to join hands with these diverse stakeholders to make this a reality. So thank you very much uh, for your patient listening and once again, uh, I'm so sorry I can't be with you in person, uh, but I hope we have a few minutes for Q&A, and I'm going to pass it back now to Professor Mohan Isaac. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Vikram.